Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As many of you know, this is Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week, and I am thrilled to have Dr. Katie Hurst with us to share some information about bipolar and babies. Dr. Hurst is the mother of two adorably precious young girls. Prior to becoming a mother, she attended Stanford University for her dual undergraduate degree, where she earned her medical degree from UC, UC San Diego. While there, she received honors for leadership, academic accomplishment, and patient care. After graduation, she completed a dual residency in family medicine and psychiatry at UCSD and founded the UCSD Maternal Mental Health Clinic. She became a regional expert in the field of reproductive psychiatry, caring for women with anxiety, mood disorders, and psychosis during pregnancy and the postpartum period. While on faculty at UCSD School of Medicine, Dr. Hurst developed the first maternal mental health intensive outpatient program in the Southwest. Additionally, she has specialized training and experience in the fields of perinatal mental health and addiction medicine. This morning, we'll hear about the unique needs of women with bipolar disorder during pregnancy and the postpartum period. Good morning, Dr. Hurst, and thank you so much for being with us. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. This is really an honor. I'm always so um, happy to be invited to give a talk like this. Um, so I wanted to be on camera just for um, a moment to say hi, so you can see my face, so I'm not just a, um, a voice coming through the speakers, but then Tracy, if you want to, I don't know, how do I take my, take me off? I um, do that right now. Okay, cool. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So I'm here to talk about, um, as Tracy said, the unique needs of women who have bipolar disorder uh, during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, I don't have anything to disclose in terms of any kind of financial conflicts of interest. And that's me and my hubby and my two sweet girls, um, just to say hello. So today's talk, we're going to be um, going over the use of medications in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And I'm not going to be talking about specific medications. Instead, I'm going to be going over a general outline of how to look at the information that uh, is out there about different medications. Um, because information is always changing, there's always new data coming out. And so what's most important is not what's out right now, um, but how we look at the information that's available so that you can really take this going, take this information and kind of use it going forward. And I'm going to give you some important resources to find that individual medication information so that you can kind of use the strategies we talk about um, to evaluate risks and benefits. And we're also going to go over several um, or a few strategies to minimize the risk of a recurrent episode during that early postpartum period. Um, early, the first few weeks um, after delivery tend to be the ones that are most, um, that are highest risk for a recurrent episode. And so there's a few ways that we can especially protect mom during that time. Um, and then if questions come up that you want to ask, um, I think there's a way to ask them and you can, uh, Tracy's going to collect them during the presentation and I'll do my best to answer um, them as we get to the end. I'll leave some time at the end. So with respect to medication use, um, as we all know, there's lots of different types of medications used to treat bipolar disorder. Every medication has a different risk profile, and we're going to talk about how to approach um, or what risk looks like during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, there are, however, even though every medication is different, there are some very clear common themes in the risk benefit kind of evaluation or discussion um, that I have with my patients and that um, you may want to have with your uh, physician or provider. Um, there's also six key points to keep in mind that are really universally true throughout um, kind of this, this spectrum of illness when we're working, when I'm working with women who have bipolar disorder who are either already pregnant or are looking at becoming pregnant um, and having a baby. So the first key point is that, um, you know, so often we think just of medication having a risk to the mother or the baby, but actually having an active illness act is, often carries even more severe risks to the mother, to the baby, um, both unborn and born, and to the family around her. 
So we need to consider um, the risk of medication, but we also really need to consider, um, is there a risk to having a depressed episode, a manic episode, or a mixed episode? And what do we know about those risks so that we can balance those in the risk-benefit discussion? The second key point that comes along with that is that what we want to do is minimize the baby's exposure to both mom's illness and the medication. So if the illness has more risk um, in terms of baby's development than the medication does, then we need to make that choice wisely. So considering that we want to have as little active illness and as little medication exposure as possible. Now, having bipolar disorder and being in a stable mood does not confer risk to your child. What I'm talking about is being in the midst of a mood episode. So as opposed to being stable, having a depressive episode, a hypomanic or manic episode, or being in a mixed episode. Having um, a stable treated illness that's in remission does not uh, confer risk, but the active illness does. Key point number three is that with only one exception, we want to use what's worked in the past. So very often um, I've seen women who have become either unexpectedly pregnant or even it's been a planned pregnancy and have just abandoned the medications and they've even been told to just stop all the medications and convert to one magical pill that we know um, more about. But the reality is that everybody is so individual and has such different responses to medicine. And as uh, I'm sure all those out there who are listening know, bipolar disorder can be very complicated and complex. Um, and so what we really want to do is use what's treat or use what's worked for treatment in the past. We don't, this is not the time to be experimenting with new medicines unless um, there's an active illness going on that we need to make a change to treat. If somebody is stable, we use what's already working um, because really so often the risk of an active illness is actually greater um, than the risk of a medication. Now, the one exception to that is valproate or Depakote. So Depakote in pregnancy can cause pretty significant birth defects early in pregnancy, so often before women even know that they're pregnant. And it can also cause problems um, with the baby's uh, neurodevelopment or brain development. And so we do see children who are exposed to Depakote even later in pregnancy having issues with um, learning and with IQ. So Depakote is the one medication that um, is really off the table for women during pregnancy. Um, and that even if that's worked in the past, we would absolutely switch. Um, if somebody, if we know that somebody's going to get pregnant or if they, if they suddenly find out that they're pregnant. Um, but key point number four. So if a woman is at a medium to high risk for either depression or a hypo or a manic episode or a mixed episode, like I was saying before, the risks from another episode might outweigh the risks from medication. So going along with continuing, if we have somebody who's stable, so often if they're at a medium to high risk of relapse into another episode um, or have a recurrent episode, um, so often the risks of having an, an active episode are actually higher than the risks of medication use. And coming back to the idea, especially about Depakote, um, because 50% of pregnancies in the U.S. are unplanned, it's very important that when I'm working with women who are in the reproductive age group, um, meaning that they have not completed menopause, um, whether or not they have a partner, we need to be very clear about how to prevent pregnancy. That is doubly important for somebody who could get pregnant, meaning that they are of the reproductive age and are on Depakote, just because Depakote can have negative effects very early on in pregnancy. So um, within one to two weeks of um, a woman's missed uh, period. So if you have bipolar disorder and you don't want to get pregnant, and this is actually true whether or not you have bipolar disorder, right? We want to use reliable birth control. And so that's a discussion that we should be having from a provider perspective with all of our patients. And um, I hope that as um, uh, people are listening, if they have their own um, possibility of getting pregnant, really, we should be thinking about how to prevent that unless we want to be pregnant. So this is um, a blank chart, except for one square. And this is how I look at the risk and benefit of treating and not treating. 
So meaning when I say treatment, I mean medications, and no treatment would be no medications. So if we look at the bottom right square, we can see the only one that is filled in um, is the benefit of not using medication. And that is that if we don't use medication, then there's no risk for meds. Um, and that makes sense. Otherwise, there's, and there may, somebody may come up with this and please feel free to, to let me know, but there's not really a, much other benefit from not using medication um, if somebody has a diagnosed um, mood or anxiety disorder um, that we know um, requires medication for stability. So now let's look at these other three squares that are empty to see how can we kind of use this chart and fill it in for individual uh, patients, individual people who have bipolar disorder so they can evaluate their own risk and also for the medications that we're looking at. So if we look at what's the benefit of being on a medication? So the question really is, what's the benefit of having a stable mood for the mom, for her baby or babies, if it's um, not a singleton, but twins or triplets perhaps, um, and for family, so meaning are there other children that are in the family? Is there a partner or spouse? Um, are there other extended family members? And so very often one of the benefits of continuing on medications in pregnancy is that um, the woman's mood is gonna remain stable, um, that she will likely have better function, um, and that means uh, better, more stable relationships, perhaps better able to function at work, um, that are able to take care of herself. Um, and then this is where this becomes personalized. So what's the benefit for you as an individual with bipolar disorder to remain on medication, either at this time or going into a pregnancy? Now coming to the risk of not, treat, not treating. So what is the risk of not using medication? This is the square that so often we don't um, fill in when we're looking at the risk and benefit. Very often we, fix, we um, focus only on what's the risk of a medication versus what's the benefit of a medication. But really we need to look at what's the risk of not taking medication. So if somebody is at a medium to high risk of having another mood episode, um, what is the risk of that episode occurring? Um, if there's either a hypomanic or a manic, a mixed or depressive episode, and is there a risk um, if that occurs to the mom, um, to her baby, and to family around her? So there's lots of different kinds of risk to mom and her family, um, right? When somebody's in a depressive episode, manic or mixed episode, it's really hard to kind of continue to have uh, healthy, stable relationships until we can end up with some dysfunction, some challenges in our relationships. Um, we do see that somebody is in, when somebody is in an active mood episode, there's a higher risk for substance use among some parts of the population. There's even a higher risk of getting into situations in which there could be violence. There's a higher risk of self-harm, whether that's um, self-harm um, uh, or actual uh, suicidal behavior. So um, hurting oneself with the intent to commit suicide or hurting oneself um, uh, only to commit um, the kind of the harm. The other risk that comes um, for mom and uh, really specifically to mom, and this can also move on to baby, is the risk of increased medication exposure. So when we get into an active episode, so often we end up having to add on or change medications. Um, we may end up with higher doses of medications. Um, to control symptoms, especially if they become severe. And so we do end up um, with increased medication exposure, both for the mom and also potentially for the child, for the baby. Um, and then there can also be physical risks to the pregnancy that come from an active episode. So there's not really great data specific to a manic episode or a mixed episode, but we do see risks um, when there's an active uh, depressive episode during pregnancy, we see a significantly increased risk of preterm delivery. So um, the baseline risk might be around 5% and it goes up to 20 to 25%. Um, there's an increased risk, like I said before, of substance use in some parts of the population. If somebody has a depressive episode during pregnancy, it's much more likely that it's going to either continue or recur postpartum. Um, and even if some uh, woman's mood is stable during 
um, the postpartum, having that depressive episode during pregnancy can also impact um, bonding with the child postpartum. We also see independent of um, mom's mood um, postpartum that having a depressive episode or very high anxiety during pregnancy can actually is correlated with higher uh, rates of childhood anxiety when we look at um, uh, young children and also into elementary school age, behavioral problems, depression among children. Um, we can see impacts on IQ as well and delayed language development when we have a depressive episode during pregnancy. And all of that is increased um, as well when we have a depressive episode postpartum. So all of this is to say that um, we need to look and consider that it's not just the medications that confer risk, it's also um, that maternal illness confers risk when there's an active mood episode going on. So finally, we come to the last square, which is what's the risk of taking a medication during pregnancy or while breastfeeding? So there's four types of risk to baby during the pregnancy. The first one is toxicity, and that would be very early on leading to miscarriage or loss of the pregnancy. The second one is our big word, teratogenicity, which is really birth defects. So our baseline rate of birth defects in the U.S. is 3 to 5 percent. So 3 to 5 percent of babies are born with some physical birth defect, um, regardless of exposure to medication or any illness. Um, and so we're really looking at medications to see does that rate of birth defects um, increase above the, the kind of norm um, that we see in the U.S. or around the world. There's developmental risk. So if a mom is taking a medication, especially if it's closer to delivery, um, is there some effect on how the baby adjusts to um, uh, life kind of after delivery? Um, with some medications, we can see syndromes where there's some jitteriness or some irritability, some difficulty feeding when um, there's some medications taken close to delivery. And then there's potential effects on long-term development. So um, just like I mentioned with Depakote, um, is there an effect on baby's IQ um, or child's IQ when they're exposed to a medication during pregnancy? And these risks kind of take place during very discrete periods of time. So we really see the risk of miscarriage increase, or we consider that the risk for toxicity or miscarriage, that's with exposure at the time of fertilization. So if there's a medication that's in the mother's system at the time that um, the embryo is being created, all the way through um, almost till the end of the first trimester. Um, with birth defects, we see the risk present from weeks four, which is right at the time of the missed period, um, until week 12. By the time we've gotten to week 12, the baby's body and organ systems are fully formed. So if we have a medication that has been shown to increase the risk of birth defects, but does not show any in, uh, impact on baby's development um, or kind of long-term behavior, then perhaps we skip the first trimester, you know, try and and uh, minimize exposure during the organ formation, and then we would um, uh, reintroduce it during second and third trimester, if that makes sense. So kind of knowing when the different risk uh, times for risk to baby are present is really important. Um, developmental, uh, an effect on um, kind of how baby grows in the womb and how the baby does after delivery can take place anytime during the second and third trimester. And then long-term neurobehavioral effects, that's also second and third trimester exposure. Now, I mentioned um, both pregnancy and breastfeeding. And so it's really important also to keep in mind that exposure in breast milk is, <laughs> and this is my way, 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 way less than exposure during pregnancy. So for example, there are medications that are considered safe during breastfeeding, but not during pregnancy. And actually Depakote is one of them. So we, that can't, uh, that's not a safe exposure during pregnancy, but actually the amount that is, um, uh, is present in breast milk is incredibly low. And so that very small amount is actually considered safe for the infant. So I will have women who are maintained on one medication during pregnancy, and then because we know they've done very well, perhaps on Depakote in the past, there may be an informed decision to switch at delivery um, and then to use Depakote um, if they're going to attempt um, to breastfeed the child. 
But keeping in mind that breastfeeding and pregnancy are two different times um, in terms of exposure and that um, the baby is getting a lot more of the medication during pregnancy um, than is getting in the breast milk. So with that being said, we've got this chart. We kind of know what questions to ask and how to evaluate um, the risks for three of the squares. But for that last square, um, we need to get very individual specific medication, uh, specific information for each medication. And so that's where these two resources are really crucial. Um, the first one is mothertobaby.org. And this is um, an amazing website that um, I will say run out of UC San Diego, um, but uh, it's available worldwide. They actually offer um, free phone counseling. You can do a web chat. They also have written summaries that you can download um, that are really kind of easily, easy to understand and digest. And you could actually call them and say, these are the medications I'm taking, kind of what are the profiles for each of them in terms of the risks during pregnancy. And they'll be able to really walk you through and give you detailed information on that. Or you can just look at it on the written summaries. The other one, if you're somebody who wants all of the data, um, which may or may not be helpful, keep in mind, um, is a group called reprotox.org. And that one, um, providers can subscribe. Um, so for example, I pay for an annual subscription there, um, but also consumers. So you're able to pay $17 and you'll have access for a month um, to any of the medications. And so you can do a search in their database and it will pull up every study that's been published um, about this medication use in pregnancy and in breastfeeding. Now the important thing to keep in mind is that sometimes all of that data can be overwhelming. Um, as a clinician, it can be overwhelming. And so it's something that can also be really helpful to go through with the mental health provider with whom you're working um, to kind of look for, okay, what is the trend? What's the overall message? Because so often we have, you know, six or seven studies that, you know, may have mostly similar but slightly conflicting results. And so that's where even bringing that information into a visit with a provider if you're planning for a pregnancy, um, that can be uh, very helpful. Now we used to have these classes from the Food and Drug Administration, so A, B, C, and I believe it was D and also X. Um, those thankfully have been phased out. So now the FDA gives kind of a more general discussion. Um, and anything that gives a medication a very simplistic letter or number ranking as safe or not safe, um, kind of in a tier ranking is really not as helpful because we need to look at these very individually based on what time of pregnancy is the woman going to be taking it um, and what has worked in the past. So it might be that, uh, for example, if I have bipolar disorder and I know that lithium is the only medication that's really kept me stable, um, there might be other medications that have slightly less risk to the infant during some periods of development during pregnancy. But I know that based on my history, uh, lithium is the one that's going to keep me most likely to, to uh, be stable during pregnancy. It might be that the risk um, with lithium use, especially in the first trimester, which is actually very small, um, it might be that that risk is okay for me individually because the risk of me having another episode is um, so great and we already know that other things have not worked. One other key point to come back to regarding the specifics of medication use during pregnancy is that as women um, progress in pregnancy, the volume of blood in their body increases really dramatically. And so um, because the woman has more blood volume, um, the medication that they're taking is almost diluted in a way. Um, and on top of that, we actually, um, as women, our livers um, and our kidneys, which serve to get rid of, um, kind of break down and get rid of a lot of medication, they go into overdrive during pregnancy. And so our livers become like crazy machines breaking down medicine faster and our kidneys start working more quickly as well. So I often see that as we get towards the second trimester end, and as we enter the third trimester, women may begin needing higher doses of medication. Um, and so sometimes I'll, if it's a medication where we can track blood levels, um, I'll make sure that I have kind of a blood level early in pregnancy or even pre-pregnancy 
um, so that I know what the level is that provides mood stability for them. And then perhaps we'll check blood levels kind of as we get into second trimester and third trimester. We might even proactively increase the medication to maintain a certain blood level. Or if at the first hint of an episode beginning, we'll kind of increase it. Um, and so that's really based on individual medication needs and communication with the provider. But it does mean that we can't, you know, I don't have somebody who I'll see once during first trimester and then I don't see them again for three months. Um, having a woman who is pregnant and um, has a diagnosis or a history of bipolar disorder means pretty close follow-up during that pregnancy, so at least monthly. Um, and definitely availability to make sure that if something comes up and there's a concern that you can get in to see that provider sooner um, or at least talk on the phone if, in case an adjustment is needed. I also want to make clear sometimes as women we get set in our minds and, and men do this too of course as humans I suppose um, this idea of well if I um, make it through to the end of pregnancy and I don't need a most dose adjustment, then somehow that's like a badge of honor. Or if I can make it through pregnancy without medication, um, or if I can make it through pregnancy and only need this dose, um, then somehow that's kind of winning <laughs> or um, maybe I'm just very competitive, um, but somehow that's succeeding in some way. And just making sure that we recognize that success here is keeping mother as stable and healthy as possible. And so expecting that there will likely be dose increases or adjustments because pregnancy is a long period of time. Um, it's not all that common. I mean, there's not that many women who have bipolar disorder and go through an eight month period of time without needing some adjustments, especially given the emotional intensity that a pregnancy brings um, and delivery uh, in the postpartum. So just recognizing that this is not a typical eight month period or nine month period in your life. Um, this, is, uh, this can be very challenging. And so setting aside any expectations or definitions of kind of success or failure and recognizing that really self care and um, doing the best you can for yourself and your baby are gonna be the most important thing. So I'm going to transition now into postpartum strategies. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. I just want to look at that chart one more time, um, just because I have a couple minutes. So if we go back to this chart, um, let's just look at this and uh, say, okay, so let's say we have um, a woman who is evaluating the risk, for example, of lithium use during pregnancy. And of course, this is I'm not going to cite all of the data correctly right now, so please don't use this as um, medical advice. But for example, when I have a woman in my office who has bipolar disorder, has been maintained on lithium and is stable, um, and ideally we're able to talk uh, before pregnancy, but you know sometimes life happens. As I said, 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. So coming in, um, I want to make sure that I have this blank chart um, laid out, either mentally or even ideally printed out and in front of her. And then we're going to go through and fill in all of the squares together. So the first square to start, start with is what is the risk of treatment? So what's the risk of taking lithium during pregnancy or breastfeeding? And so first starting off saying, okay, is there a risk of toxicity? So has lithium been associated with an increased risk of miscarriage? Um, and looking at the data there. Um, looking at, okay, is there data suggesting that lithium has been associated with an increased risk of birth defects? Um, looking at then, is there an increased risk of some adjustment problems for the baby after delivery? And then do we know of any long-term development risks? Um, with lithium exposure during pregnancy. Then I'm gonna come back and look at, okay, well, what are the benefits of staying on a medication, um, lithium specifically? And, for, and, and the woman will hopefully be able to kind of fill in, well, when she's stable and not in an active illness, right, she's able to have a better relationship with a partner. She's able to take care of herself better. You know, all the things that we're able to do when we're not in the midst of a, of a mood episode. Then looking at, okay, what's the risk of discontinuing a medication um, or of not being on a medication? If this is somebody who has um, not had very many mood episodes, they've not been very severe, then that might be a slightly different discussion than somebody who's required hospitalization um, or has had some really severe 
um, our uh, episodes in the past. Looking at, though, that when we do see specific episodes, like a depressive episode um, during pregnancy, we see actual effects on the pregnancy um, duration, and we see effects on the, on the baby, the unborn child as well. And then finally, looking at, okay, is there a benefit from not taking the lithium? And one of the benefits is no risk from meds. Sometimes women will cite the benefit being um, that um, they don't need, um, uh, sorry, um, sometimes they'll say that the benefit is that maybe they'll have more peace of mind um, because they won't be on medication um, during that time. Tracy, was there a question that just came in also? There is. Um, let me read it for you. It says, do you suggest changing medication and or dosing that would be safe for the first trimester before a woman conceives? That's the first question. Okay, so um, do I suggest changing medication or dosing before the first trimester? So, you know, it really depends on what the person, what the woman is taking. So if the woman is, if, if this is a patient, for example, who has a history of severe mood episodes and is very stable on the current regimen, um, then very often um, I would suggest staying on the regimen that keeps that person stable. If, however, you know, sometimes I have, actually often I have women come in who are stable and also recognize that they want to get pregnant, but we have some time, so they're planning out. Um, so if we wanted to, for example, try and adjust the medications and minimize how many medicines they're on, maybe we have time to do that. It is best to, like I said earlier with that, I think it's the second point, right, to minimize medication exposure as long as the woman can, be, can remain stable during that time. So sometimes I'll have people come in who have had episodes, and this happens very often where medications get added on during a mood episode, and then the person just gets kind of continued on them. And we end up on a cocktail of two or three meds, and we're not really sure if all of them are needed. If we can plan ahead of time and spend, you know, six months to a year kind of slowly weaning off one or two of the medicines and really evaluating, okay, how's the stability, how's your mood, that, I mean, that's like the most beautiful situation um, because then we can really see um, how little medicine do we need, um, but we can also do it in a very mindful, deliberate manner. What I don't recommend is hastily getting off of medicine just for the sake of being on only one. Um, because again, most of the medications that are out there um, confer less risk than a severe mood episode. And as I said before, with a severe mood episode, if you end up, of course, hospitalized, you know, more often than not, even if you're not hospitalized, we end up treating with higher doses of medicines to kind of restore, restore stability. Um, I hope that that makes sense. Oh, the other thing I will say is that there is really interesting data showing or a really interesting study showing that the duration of time for a taper off of a medication before pregnancy or even during pregnancy impacts stability. So if we can spend four weeks, um, even 12 weeks or 16 weeks doing a very slow taper off of a medicine, then we are much more likely to have mood stability compared to if we do a really quick taper off over just two weeks. Um, I've rarely seen somebody do a quick taper who's been able to stay stable uh, for very long. So really the longer duration of a taper, um, the better. And that's true universally for psychiatric medications. I generally spend like, you know, a year maybe taking somebody off of an antidepressant. Um, and that's, you know, not necessarily in the context of planning for a pregnancy, but the longer a taper, the better. What was the second question, Tracy? I think you answered it. it uh, she said that she's done research and she found that ideally women only take one medication and that potentially with a lower dose. Right. And yeah, so, right. So again, it's, there's this ideal out there of, you know, what's the perfect plan and the perfect pregnancy, and it just doesn't exist, right? Everybody's different. Every woman is going to have different needs. And so that's why I'm looking, doing this very individualized 
risk benefit discussion with your provider um, is so important because for some women, yeah, they can get down to a low dose of a single move stabilizer, but for many women, that's not possible and that's okay. Um, I've had plenty of patients who have required two or three medications during pregnancy um, and we've had lots of discussions ongoing about that and they've done beautifully during the pregnancy and have these like gorgeous, healthy children afterwards. Um, so it's really about assessing the whole uh, picture, not just considering the medication to be the problem. Thanks, those are great questions. Oops, so I'm gonna get back to then now, let's go into some postpartum strategies. Um, so the first strategy, if we, you know, so we've gotten, um, a woman's gotten through pregnancy. Um, the first strategy is actually in that third trimester and ideally throughout the, the pregnancy, but having um, the partner or a support person present um, at at least one of the visits with the mental health provider. So, you know, I want to, when I'm seeing a woman who is pregnant or even planning to get pregnant, I really want that partner or a support person involved in um, the woman's care. Not that the woman can't make choices for herself, obviously, but um, because, you know, the more support we have, the better. And so, especially in the third trimester, I have at least one visit that has the partner or a family support person present. Um, and I say that very clearly because, you know, the reality is I think in the U.S. it's more than 50% of children are born and it's not a marriage that there's, you know, a partner situation or a woman having a, a child by herself. And so recognizing that families take all different shapes um, and forms these days. And so, but it is really important to have at least one identified support person um, come to a visit before delivery to meet with either a psychiatrist and possibly a therapist as well to go over what are the signs of a mood episode, either a depressive episode, a manic or a mix based on the woman's history. What are some reasons that the partner or support person might want to um, or have permission to call the psychiatrist and really having that planned out ahead of time so that um, the woman is aware of, you know, if, if something's going on, does her partner have permission to make a call and say, hey, we need to come in sooner? Um, because earlier intervention is always going to be better um, when we're looking at um, these first postpartum weeks. And it's also really important um, because we have often made medication adjustments as pregnancy has gone on, very important that there then be a plan for what are we going to do with medication um, during labor, if it's a long labor, and at the time of delivery. So for example, Lamictal, uh, Lamotrigine is a mood stabilizer, and lithium often get up to much higher doses um, during late second and third trimester just because of how quickly they get broken down. So very important then that the woman knows and communicates with her obstetrics provider, either the OB or a midwife, um, what is the plan for immediately after delivery? And oftentimes that dose is going to come right down after delivery um, because mom is going to stop processing so quickly. So um, she needs to have that written plan from the psychiatrist or whoever's providing mental health care to give to the OB treatment team, ideally in her chart and even to carry a written plan with her to the hospital because we all know how well medical record systems um, function. They're not always the most reliable. Another key point that goes along with postpartum strategies is that breastfeeding is great, but for a woman with bipolar disorder or even a history of severe depression that's not bipolar disorder, sleep is really better. And so can breastfeeding an infant and getting adequate sleep coexist? Absolutely. But if I had to choose, I would put sleep ahead um, of breastfeeding. I would consider, and I do consider sleep to be along the lines of a medication for bipolar disorder. So um, when sleep is lacking, it's like having taken away a mood stabilizer. Sleep is a healing for the brain of somebody with bipolar disorder, especially the middle of the night hours, you know, the midnight to 3 or 4 a.m. It's crucial. What are the exact hours that an infant disrupts? Those middle of the night hours. So when we look at breastfeeding versus sleep, it doesn't have to be an either or situation, um, but we do need to kind of approach it with this idea of um, is breast always best, right? Recognizing formula is food for the baby, just like breast milk is. Um, from a provider standpoint, I always reinforce when I'm training providers um, that we don't just say, are you breastfeeding, right? It's are you breast or bottle feeding? 
how are you feeding your child? That's the most important part, right? There, there, this pendulum has swung so far from formula to breast milk in this country. And I think in a lot of parts of the world, we really need to bring it back to this place of being rational and logical. Now, there's a lot of women for whom breastfeeding is not the best solution, um, is not the best kind of plan, and is also not possible. So when we look at women, though, who want to breastfeed their child and also want to protect their sleep, there's this myth of nipple confusion, so that if you introduce a bottle to the infant too early, um, the baby won't be able to continue breastfeeding. That's really um, kind of along the lines of a myth. It's really uncommon for that to happen. So introducing the idea of a bottle early on into baby's life is one of the things that's gonna allow mom to get some sleep. Also, um, looking at milk supply, skipping one or two feedings um, in the uh, kind of during the night so that mom can sleep is for most women not going to affect their milk supply to the point where they won't be able to breastfeed. It may be that they need to pump during the day to stimulate more, um, but sleep is a treatment. Sleep is a medication for bipolar disorder. It's not the only one, but it's a really important component. So we need to start the discussion with the OB treatment team before delivery. That in those first few nights, some women spend one night in the hospital after delivery, some women spend you know, two to four, or even five, depending on how the delivery went. We have to minimize nighttime disruptions in the hospital. Most women that I see who have delivered have gotten no sleep for goodness knows how many days because of how many times um, nurses and CNAs and providers are coming in in the middle of the night. Um, I highly recommend talking with the treatment team ahead of time, talking with um, the nurses on the floor, making sure that it is clear that this is a woman for whom sleep is really important. And so having a partner or support person there who can feed the baby during the night and then actually putting a physical sign on the door asking that uh, providers don't disturb. And I will even go so far as to say do not disturb unless it's a life-threatening situation between the hours of 11 and 5, for example. That chunk of sleep is critical to promoting um, postpartum mental health in, uh, in women. As we are in the hospital and then moving home, it's really important to look at social support. So who else can feed this baby? right? Um, and I say this baby lovingly, and I hope that doesn't sound harsh, um, right? But mom can't be the only person who's responsible if we expect her to uh, remain stable. We need other family members, partners to be able to help. And so really protecting um, a chunk of sleep for mom every day is going to mean that other members of the family um, help with feeding. And early on, that will likely mean some formula supplementation, um, for those first several night feedings. It may be that mom is unable to pump enough during the day to um, have breast milk in the bottle at night. Um, it may be that baby continues getting some formula at night and mom's able to breastfeed the rest of the time during the day. Everybody's different, but again, the risk of a mood episode um, when sleep is disrupted, we know at baseline, even without a pregnancy and a delivery, right? When somebody misses sleep or has disrupted sleep for a few nights in a row and they have bipolar disorder, it's a really risky period of time. And there's a very um, higher likelihood that that person is going to go into a mood episode. So it's really important that um, we stabilize sleep and protect it as much as possible in these first few weeks. Because what we see is that it's these first few weeks um, that are the highest risk. Um, time for a mood episode. The other um, strategy is having very close follow-up with mental health. So if I have a woman who um, has a scheduled C-section, that's easy, right? Easy peasy um, in terms of scheduling her follow-up. When I have somebody who, you know, is not in that small percentage of women, then what I generally schedule is, um, you know, I'm seeing her probably every two to four weeks in those last six weeks of pregnancy um, to check in, especially because um, we may end up needing more medication changes as um, her blood volume continues increasing and medicine um, is kind of less uh, stable. Also, the emotional strain of late pregnancy and the um, strain it can take on our sleep, right? When we are in our third trimester of pregnancy, it's uncomfortable and most of us are not sleeping. 
So it's not just those immediate first few weeks after delivery where sleep can get disrupted. It's in that third trimester as well. And so recognizing, um, you know, I will often actually use medication to stabilize women's sleep during those last few weeks of pregnancy so that they're not already in a disrupted sleep state going into delivery. Um, following up closely around the time of delivery, so having an appointment scheduled around the due date, you know, with if we need to cancel it, we need to cancel it. But, you know, if you're not in labor yet, please come on in, let's check. Um, having one about two weeks after delivery, every four weeks, and then six weeks postpartum. When we've made it to six weeks postpartum and the woman's mood is stable, I can do a little happy dance because I feel like we're kind of out of the woods. It's those first four to six weeks where we're at the highest risk for um, having a, another mood episode. So really close follow-up during that time um, and plans in place, communication with the partner, and sometimes communication with the partner during those visits postpartum as well. Um, because, you know, new babies are stressful for moms and partners. Um, mom having an illness that we're paying close attention to, just like if she had lupus, just like if she had diabetes, right? We probably have the partner coming in to, to talk about it. And so we want to also um, make that an option um, with it with bipolar disorder. Like I said before, treat insomnia. So if the mom can't sleep when baby sleeps at night, right? Um, it's so often it's impossible to sleep when the baby's sleeping during the day because there's just other things to do. But if baby is sleeping at night and mom can't sleep, that's concerning. Um, in those first few weeks, as uh, those of you who have had children know, the baby often doesn't sleep at night. And so, but mom needs to be able to sleep during those hours. So um, if there's insomnia, um, somebody else has baby, has care uh, for the baby and you still can't sleep, then you need to be in contact with your mental health provider. Um, and that's where if there's not a history of substance use, for example, I'll use um, a short course of something like Ativan or Klonopin. Um, I'll do that as well sometimes in pregnancy um, to stabilize sleep because sleep is so important. And then finally, let's just remind ourselves that there is hope and there's a lot of success when we approach pregnancy um, and plan for it. Um, even when we're not planning for it, even when there's a surprise pregnancy, when we can really respond rationally and logically and make decisions, taking into account the entire picture. Um, I've seen so many women get through pregnancy successfully, um, have babies and be able to make it through um, the postpartum. Um, and when a mood episode does arise, we're usually in a much better place to respond to it earlier. Um, we have fewer, we have fewer kind of ramifications of that or consequences, and we're able to do it in a much kind of gentler, um, more mindful way than uh, if we haven't been communicating throughout the process. So thousands, I'd venture millions of women who have had both bipolar disorder over, you know, however long, centuries, right, um, millennia, uh, have made it through pregnancy and postpartum both safely, but most importantly, happily. And so this is very possible. Um, and I want to just make sure that we leave this with some hope and looking forward because pregnancy is a beautiful thing, right? How wonderful that somebody wants to have um, a child. And um, I'm very honored always to be included in that process um, to help make it as good uh, as possible. So um, final resource is um, I put in the two resources earlier for medication information. I also want to put up postpartum.net. Um, this is the website for Postpartum Support International. Um, and of course, you know, it's not just postpartum, it's pregnancy as well. And so they have a resource list with providers who are trained in pregnancy and postpartum mood and anxiety disorders, both therapists and um, prescribers. And that is all, that's international, but that's certainly within the U.S. Um, in North America. Um, and so if you are thinking of getting pregnant or are pregnant, you can go to that website and ideally try and find somebody who's close to you um, and just in case your provider is not comfortable or is not educated on this as unfortunately um, not enough psychiatrists are. Um, they also have a listing for support groups for women who are pregnant and postpartum. Um, and those support groups, even if you're doing well, can still be wonderful just to be around other women um, who are kind of going through similar, um, similar things. And then finally, there is my contact information in case um, 
anything comes up um, down the line. And Tracy, I think I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hurst, for sharing this information, especially this week, um, where we're mindful and appreciating focus on maternal mental health. So we're gonna have time for um, a few questions. Um, so if you have a question, you can shoot it over and we'll ask Dr. Hurst. Um, the first question um, comes about medication, and I know you referred to Depakote um, as not being compatible with pregnancy. Um, how, what are your thoughts on Risperdal while pregnant? Oh, that's a great question. So um, it's so interesting because Risperdal um, and that class of medications came out um, gosh, just, I mean, while I was in training, so in the early 2000s. And so thankfully, um, we've gathered a lot of information um, in the last 15 years on uh, Risperdal use during pregnancy. Um, I would refer you to mothertobaby.org for up-to-date information. Um, the last time that I checked, and again, this is not meant as individual medical advice, um, but I have had women go through pregnancy on Risperdal because, again, we're looking at is there a risk of birth defects um, and is there any information on kind of child development after exposure. And what I've seen is actually that things have looked pretty favorable um, for Risperdal in terms of lower risk for taking that, certainly compared to um, Depakote or some of the other medications. Um, but I would definitely look that up. Mother to baby will have updated information, as will Reprotox. Um, and as we are using more of the, that class of medication for mood stabilization, so we're not just using the traditional um, kind of Depakote, lithium um, medications, I think we do have a pretty good amount of data on that um, for, for use in pregnancy. So I definitely use that with women um, when that's the medication that we know has worked. Great, thank you so much, that's a great resource. The next question um, has to do with holistic, holistic and natural um, things to do. So the question is, do you have any thoughts on key holistic or natural things to do to help with pregnancy and bipolar disorder? So I, um, yes, um, my, I mean, I am a huge supporter of women using any resource um, that is helpful to them. So there's not, I don't know of specific studies looking at bipolar disorder and methods like yoga, mindfulness meditation, um, acupuncture, but I know that we do have data with specifically unipolar depression showing that acupuncture can be very helpful um, during a depressive episode, um, showing that um, exercise, um, I think even a study on yoga, if I'm not thinking correctly, um, bright light exposure, um, and also uh, my, some mindfulness practices can be helpful. The concern is that, you know, you're, it's not a unipolar disease, it's a bipolar disease. And so um, what I really encourage women to do is this is where if we're planning ahead for pregnancy, then we can maximize all of the resources that a woman is taking advantage of. So if a woman is on a medic, you know, a few medications that are helpful, we could perhaps try planning ahead of time, um, peeling back, very slowly tapering off one or two of those while instituting these supportive um, treatments. So using acupuncture, especially I'm a big fan of mindfulness meditation um, in my own, I have a daily practice and I teach it um, as a way to support mental health um, so that the woman can find all of those other complementary treatments to use along with a mood stabilizer. I have not, however, seen any data um, that would show that um, anything in the kind of complementary alternative holistic treatment world can replace um, the use of our traditional psychiatric medications for a fundamental mood stabilizing, unfortunately. I, if, I wish that that were there, but I think that there is something I'm not a huge fan of uh, <laughs> my own field in a lot of ways um, in terms of the amount of medication that we prescribe. I'm probably not supposed to say that, but that's okay. Um, I think we overprescribe a lot. Um, however, with bipolar disorder, I think that we do end up having to rely on um, at least a traditional mood stabilizer or some sort of mood stabilizer. But if we can minimize or lower that dose with using any alternative treatments, absolutely, that's wonderful. I wish I had more specific answers for you, I'm sorry. No, that was great. Thank you so much. 
Um, the next question is about caregiving. So as a caregiver, what can I look for in the postpartum period um, that might indicate an upcoming episode? Oh, that is such a fabulous question. Um, so this is where if you're able to go with um, the partner or family member um, that you're with um, to talk with a psychiatrist, that is the most helpful um, in terms of planning during third, third trimester, because then you can really find out what are the signs that are unique to, um, to the person that you're with, um, because everybody is somewhat different. Clearly, I mean, there are clear signs of, for example, a hypo or a manic episode. Insomnia is really universal to both depression and mania. Um, and so if somebody is having trouble sleeping, um, that's a really clear sign. Um, you know, if we look at increased activity, so when somebody is up having more activity during times that they might otherwise be sleeping, talking more quickly, um, physically moving around more, um, or the opposite, right? Not um, as motivated, um, not as interactive with the baby postpartum, um, not, uh, not able to take as much initiative. Um, those are some kind of clear signs. But again, this is where having uh, a person's consent to speak with their mental health provider can be so helpful. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is about conception. Um, and the question is, I'm currently in the middle of a hypomanic episode and working closely with my doctor. Should I wait a certain amount of time to try to start conceiving? Oh, great question. So first of all, kudos to you um, for thinking ahead like that. That's awesome. Um, I, so many women, um, you know, aren't, don't do that. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a specific amount of time because of the hypomanic episodes um, per se. But what I, what I recommend to my patients, and I guess what I'm saying is I don't have a study to back me up on this, but what I recommend to my patients is six months of stability um, before we um, talk about kind of trying to conceive. Not that I'm involved directly in that process, obviously, but um, if I have somebody and we're looking at um, this woman uh, wanting to become pregnant, I do recommend six months of being out of the hypomanic episode, being stable, and especially being on stable doses of medication um, for about that length of time before starting trying to conceive. Great, thank you. We have time for one more question, um, and it is, if I have a manic episode during my last postpartum period, is it more likely that I will have one in my next pregnancy? Um, I, not necessarily during the next pregnancy, but um, I would say that that puts you at a higher risk during the next postpartum uh, period. With that being said, it would be very interesting to look at um, sleep protection um, because I think very often um, we are not protecting women's sleep postpartum and that is often a clear trigger of a manic episode, um, just like that would trigger anybody who wasn't postpartum. So um, just because somebody has had a manic episode in a postpartum um, period does not mean 100% that they're going to have another one. Um, that's important to, to, rec to recognize. Um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't have another child um, if, you, if that is something that you want and are planning for. Um, but it does mean that we need to pay closer attention um, and really clearly plan, um, put into place some of those protective strategies um, in order to kind of minimize that risk. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Hurst, for your time this morning and this really valuable information I'm on pregnancy, postpartum, and bipolar. Appreciate your time, and everyone have a great rest of your maternal mental health awareness week. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.